Welcome. Welcome. He's alive. Say that with me. He's alive. Amen. And that's why we're here this morning. If Jesus Christ were not alive, folks, we would not be here this morning. And I'm glad that you have come. And uh, I know God's going to bless you through his Holy Spirit this morning. Uh, we have several folks who are very special this morning, haven't been here due to their illnesses in a while. Miss Debbie, we're glad to have you. God bless you. Miss Dale fell the other week back here I, and uh, broke some ribs, and she's been out. And uh, where is Jackie? Jackie has backslid all the way to the back. Being out for a few weeks didn't help Jackie. He's backslid. Jackie had to get a new pacemaker. So we're glad that God has blessed these folks and they're able to join us this morning. And I know that we have folks who are visiting this morning. And we're just happy that you've come to worship the risen Christ this morning. Because he makes all the difference, all the difference in the world. And so we're just glad that you're here this morning. And if you give me a moment, I'll find out where we are and where we're supposed to go from here. Uh, I do appreciate these, those of you who place these lilies in the church. Uh, They're beautiful. Thank Miss Peggy who uh, coordinated all of that for us. And when you leave this morning, uh, please take these with you. And you know you can plant them. And they'll grow. Uh, even me without a green thumb can do that. And so just to make good use of them, they'll come back up next year, dig them up and bring them to church, and you won't have to buy one next, next Easter. <laughs> I don't promise that, <laughs> but I do promise you could plant them and they'll grow because we had some that, that grew, and, uh, but we're just glad that you're here this morning and we'll pray God's going to bless you. Now, we're going to, uh, Greg's going to lead us in singing, uh, very appropriate because he lives, we'll remain standing for a responsive reading, okay? Okay, let's take our... Like to use one, but he, nevertheless, our first song is verse one of Because He Lives. So let's stand and sing together. Our words will be on the screen behind me here. God sent His Son. Right to say amen. amen. Okay, he lives. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives because he lives in my heart. 
Mark 16 is our responsive reading this morning. You can use a screen or use your bulletin. And so let's read responsively this morning, that first, that first Easter morning, and when the Sabbath was passed. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet, sweet spices they, that they might come and anoint the body of Jesus. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were afraid. But go your way, tell his disciples, and I like this. <laughs> Peter got a special, special invitation. Tell the disciples. And tell Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus had cast seven devils. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. And they went and told it unto the residents. Neither believe they them. You may be seated. Normally at this time we have our prayer time around the altar, but uh, due to the fact that we are uh, we're a little crowded this morning, uh, I want to ask the deacons to come and join me on the uh, here at the front this morning for a time of prayer. Uh, and again, we thank God for those who have been healed. And uh, there's some of our folks who are still going through uh, difficult times. Uh, Miss Noreen is in the nursing home, as is Miss Rebecca. Uh, Mr. Pym is still healing from his surgery, and their daughter Joyce had surgery this week, and she is home from the hospital and healing. And as I, as I told you last week, Joyce has cancer for a second time, and she especially needs our prayers. Father, it's a blessed privilege for the children of God to gather in the house of God and to worship, sing these great old hymns, read from the Holy Scriptures, and then, Father, to pray one for another. Thank you this morning that you have blessed our church fellowship by uh, granting healing to Miss Debbie from the heart surgery and and uh, to, to Miss Dale, who could be here this morning after her accident, and and for blessing J- Jackie and his being here this morning after the after the uh, uh, pacemaker replacement. But Father, others this morning, some of whom we've met- mentioned, and we pray for them this morning. We pray that as we gather in this place and as we worship you this morning, as we pray for them. I pray the Holy Spirit of God would make them very mindful of our concern for them and our prayers in their behalf. Father, this is a glorious day. It's a great day. There are actually no adjectives that can in any way describe what this day means to us as children of God. It is everything. And we want to thank you this morning for caring enough for us, loving us so deeply that you allowed your Son to come from heaven to earth and to suffer the torments, the torture, the cruelties that he suffered on the cross of Christ, shed, his, shed every drop of his blood that we might be, that we might receive atonement from our sins, Father. We thank you for that. But Father, even more glorious this morning is the fact that the grave could not contain him. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah. 
Christ arose. As we're going to look at in the sermon this morning, the resurrection, the resurrection tells us your attitude toward your precious Son, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you for the resurrection this morning. Father, we can never pray in these perilous times without remembering, Father, that we live in a country that was established by you. Our forefathers were godly men, men who believed that they could build a nation upon Judeo-Christian values, and they did that. And now, Father, we have walked away from those great values. And, Father, we need a turning again to our Father. And I'm reminded of Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, and that's us, called by my name, and that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. God, we're praying for revival. Our only hope that they... It's not in some party, but our hope and our only hope is in God. And I pray that America will wake up soon, Father, and turn back to you. And you might bless us in the future as you have so graciously blessed us in the past. If there's somebody here this morning who doesn't know this risen Jesus, I pray the Holy Spirit would be very real to them this morning. And just finger about their heart and bring them to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. For it's in his name I pray, and for his sake I pray. Amen. Amen. is uh, I live number 366 we'll sing this and then have a hymn following that so let's stand together and sing I live standing with me and let's sing one more song before our offering time today and that's Christ Arose number 357 we'll sing all three of these verses and then have a time for our morning offering
Most gracious Heavenly Father, what an awesome feeling to wake up this morning and to know that prophecy was fulfilled and you grows. Heavenly Father, we realize that there's some in this nation and this world that have not had the ability to hear this word. Heavenly Father, we pray that this offering would go out to reach those. Heavenly Father, we also pray that you remain with us through the service, prepare our hearts for the message. In the most glorious name we pray, amen.
say two stanzas of amazing grace for me this morning. Okay? Amen. Amen. That's what Easter is all about. The amazing grace of God. Now I see it already. We've got visitors this morning. So y'all are trying to act dignified. <laughs> it's all right to say amen. amen. And if you don't say it at the appropriate time, I'm going to hold my sign up. Because this is Hallelujah Sunday. Amen? Amen. This is a day the church ought to rejoice. Rejoice. Also, Lada called me this morning from down at the police department <coughs> and said they were going to give me time to get through my sermon before they came lock me up. <laughs> now, he, he, he called me this morning. He texted uh, Travis back here and he said that... Uh, he had tuned in some of the folks down at the police department and back in the jail today, and they're going to be watching our program on, uh, on the computer that I set up for them a few weeks ago. <laughs> they are watching, and we are so, so happy. They're some of the finest people I know, and I have the privilege of working with them at uh, they bless my life like you bless my life. And uh, uh, as the sheriff and I talk often, somebody said the other day, Sheriff, if we continue like we're going, we're going to have a record year this year. That's not a record we're proud of. Had a funeral in Greenville on Thursday. One of the young officer who, whose life was taken yay too early and had one shot in Charlotte yesterday sometime. And so these are very special people that I'm very glad this morning that they're uh, uh, it's possible modern technology for them to uh, to listen to us this morning and, and to worship with us. I uh, I saw advertisement the other day by a church, and I'll not call their name, but they had this little advertisement about their uh, Easter service, and they uh, they. I know what the pastor was trying to say. Um, 
he said the message is going to be in a conversational tone. What he meant is I ain't going to preach to you too hard. <laughs> That's pretty much a modern day idea, you know, that we just, uh, and it's good we can talk about the gospel and teach the gospel, but uh, uh, Paul said to preach the gospel. And I don't think you can preach the gospel, particularly uh, this story this morning. I don't think you can preach it without some emotion uh, in your heart. The story that we're dealing with this morning is 2,000 years old. But listen to me carefully. The message is as relevant as today. This story never changes. It's the same story full of as much impact and power and joy and peace as uh, when it took place 2,000 years ago. We sang it, but it was already in my sermon this morning, and so I'm going to repeat those words because I think they describe something of how uh, we feel this morning. Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus my Lord. Up from the grave he rose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. Hallelujah, Christ arose. And that's why we're here this morning, because Jesus rose from the grave. I want to talk this morning about uh, the full message of, of the gospel of Christ. And I think you need, to, you need to understand the full message if you're going to understand the message of the resurrection. And the full message is simply this, Jesus lived. He lived in heaven before he came to earth. In fact, the Bible says that uh, without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus was, along with the Father, and along with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God's Son who came to earth, participated in the creation of this world of ours. He lived in eternity, and he came to earth and lived for 33 and a half years, a sinless life, a sinless life. Without that sinless life, it would not have been possible for the Son of God to bear our sins on Calvary as he did. Jesus lived. That, that, is, that is a historical fact this morning. That Jesus lived, and most people believe that he lived. But something more importantly, Jesus died. The death of Jesus was planned by God almost in the beginning of creation when man sinned. God began the process in the Garden of Eden. God began the process of planning to send a Redeemer, a Savior, a Messiah to this earth. And the scripture says that in the fullness of time, when it was in God's proper time, Jesus came. We talk a great deal today about the second coming of Jesus. I can tell you when Jesus is coming. In the fullness of God's time, he will come. Not a day too early, not a day too late. The Son of God is coming back to this earth. And many of us believe, as we interpret the scriptures, we believe that Jesus is coming back soon. But none of us can put our finger on a day or a time when Jesus is coming. But I promise you this morning, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is coming back to this earth one day. And I hope you're ready to meet him. The Bible says he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says the blood of Jesus, God's son cleanses us from all sin. And I love that old song. I'm, I'm a lover of the hymns. I, I've said many times that in those churches today where all they sing are the modern contemporary songs that our children are missing great blessings because theology, we find theology in almost every hymn that's been written, and these young people are not learning theology as, as, as uh, hymns teach us. And I love the one, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And I want you to know that nobody took Jesus' life. Jesus himself said, no man can take my life from me. Jesus gave up his life voluntarily. The Bible says he is a lamb. He was a lamb without spot 
and without blemish. In Christ Jesus, you who were once dead in sin have been made alive in God this morning. And for that we can be truly and eternally grateful this morning. The only way that a man can make peace with God, the only way a man can have his sins forgiven is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Peter said it best when he said, we're not redeemed with silver and gold, but we're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. And I love that old song that uh, Andre Kraut sang so beautifully he, when he sang, the blood will never, ever lose its power. The blood of Jesus Christ is as powerful today in 2016 as it was when Jesus shed it on Calvary's cross. Amen. Y'all going to make me work this morning for my money. Amen. It's all right to say amen at that. If you, if you can't say amen at that, Fred, there's something missing. Jesus, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Amen. And I believe this. If I had been the only sinner or if you had been the only sinner on the face of the earth, I believe that God would have loved us enough. Jesus would have loved us. He would have come from glory, died on that cross, shed every drop of blood for our sins. And I thank God for that. Not only did he live, not only did he die, but friend, most importantly, Jesus arose yesterday I I sat for a while and I just thought if you haven't done this you, you need to do it I sat there and I thought what it, what it must have been like when those disciples and close followers of Jesus. What must it have been like for that to, for those two days? You ever thought about that? Well, I sat yesterday at, at, at length, and wh what must it have been like? You think about that for a moment this morning. Those, those, uh, those men were, were fearful. They really were. They, uh, they, didn't, they didn't know when the soldiers were going to come. They didn't know when they were going to be taken away as Jesus was. They were anticipating literally their, losing their own lives. They were depressed and despondent. I believe a conversation perhaps arose among them, something like this. We have spent three and a half years of our lives, three and a half of the best years of our lives. And we wasted those years. Don't you think they thought something like that? Peter, the most boisterous of the, of the group, probably, probably said, as we know he said later on at least, Peter probably said, fellas, Let's go back to the fishing nets. More profit in fishing than there is in following this man called Jesus. I think they felt that way. It was a black day and a dark day. I think the song that's one of my favorites at Easter perhaps describes it better than words that I could put together this morning. It says they all walked away with nothing to say. They just lost their dearest friend. All that he said. Now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. The dreams they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the garden, the jail, the hammer, the nails. How could a night be so long? Then came the morning, night turned into day. 
the stone was rolled away. Hope rose with the dawn, then came the morning. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won for morning had come. It's the way it is. Morning came. A new day. Because Jesus the Christ had risen. What does the resurrection from a practical standpoint mean to us this morning? It's very difficult to put in order the things that I thought in preparation for the sermon this week. But I can tell you what I consider the most important thing. The resurrection. Resurrection was God's stamp of approval upon His Son, who He was and what He had done. You remember at the... You remember at the... Uh, Baptism of Jesus. Remember that God the Father spoke from heaven and he said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well placed. I think God shouted louder at the resurrection. I think God said with the clearest voice God could say it. I think God said it with the loudest voice he could say it. I think the angels of heaven sang as God said to the entire world at the resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Everything He said He was, He was. Everything that He did, God said, I approve of it. You know what else God said? God said, I accept the blood. Now we live in an age, folks, when people don't want to talk about a bloody religion. Let me tell you something. If you don't have a bloody religion, you don't have a Christian religion. If you don't have a bloody religion, if you don't have a Savior whose veins flowed with blood, you don't have a Savior who shed His blood. Beloved, I want to tell you something. You might have some form of religion, but you don't have Christianity and you don't have salvation. What does the resurrection say to me? It says in no uncertain terms, God is saying, I accept, I prove what my son did for me on the cross. If you haven't read lately, I would uh, encourage you to read sometime. Today would be the best day to do it. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul describes in a beautiful way what it would be like if there were no resurrection. One of the things that Paul said is he said our preaching would be in vain. In in, in fact, Paul was saying what I'm doing up here this morning is ridiculous. (laughs) If Christ be not raised, then we don't have a message to preach. We don't have a gospel to proclaim this morning if Christ be not risen from the grave. I could talk a long time about that. Let me tell you something else. Resurrection proclaims, it proclaims joy. There are a lot of joyless Christians today. You know that? I look out sometimes. Man, I wonder if folks ate sour pickles before they came to church. (laughs) Man, you don't know the Jesus I know. That's why they can't say amen. Now, I've said this a lot of times, but I said for, for our visitor friends this morning, I believe in purgatory. Now, don't get up and leave me. I believe a lot of Christians have got to go through purgatory to get ready to go to heaven because they don't know how to rejoice. Now, I really don't believe in purgatory. Got to do something to them to get them excited. You know, Christianity is a religion of joy. And I went through the scriptures and... and, and I'm just going to mention these and challenge you to go do your own, do your own homework. Boy, uh, in John chapter 20, well, that's a beautiful story. 
Mary Magdalene, <laughs> Mary Magdalene, one of the first at the tomb, and she, uh, she, uh, boy, what, what the Lord had done for her. She went there in grief. You know how she left? With joy. You look at the other women who came in Matthew 28, 9, and 10. You look at the women who came and, and they, like Mary Magdalene, they went there with sadness. And they came away with gladness. One of the most beautiful stories about the, after the resurrection of Jesus, one of the most beautiful stories are those men who were walking along the Emmaus Road in Luke 24. And when Jesus left them, you know what they said? Did not our hearts burn within us? Boy, I think you could easily translate that to say, did not joy fill and flood our hearts? Let me tell you something else. We have peace with God because of the resurrection. The multitudes upon multitudes of people who live today and who live without peace. But God gives us through Jesus Christ a peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're going to go through. And Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Look at him, not the world. You'll have peace. That's what men need. But let me tell you one other thing this morning. Yesterday, uh, my mom and I went as we do every during every Easter season, and uh, placed flowers on our parents' graves at uh, Laurelwood Cemetery in Rock Hill. My mom died in 1971. And, uh, boy, when I stood there yesterday, almost 30 years ago, when I stood there yesterday, I stood there with as much hope that as I had the day that we laid my mother to rest on a snowy February afternoon. I know that I know that I know, that I know, that I know I'm going to see her in glory one day. That's my hope. One of the saddest things in the world for me as a pastor is to uh, conduct a funeral and realize that the family was left with no hope that see their loved one. Many of you, and I look into the faces of many of you this morning, and I've had that time when I conducted the funeral of your loved one. I was talking to Miss Rebecca recently, and she's the most recent one in our church family to have, to have laid uh, Mr. Carl to rest. When I began to, when I began to talk with Miss Rebecca about the fact, Miss Rebecca got hope. You know what? Tears began to stream down her cheeks. But I'll tell you something. Her face lit up when I began to talk to Miss Rebecca about the fact we're going to see Mr. Carl again one day. Amen. Mr. John, you're going to see Miss Corrine one day. Mike? Mr. Bill, we're going to see Miss Ruth one day. Amen. Sheriff, we're going to see your mom again one day. Amen. Many of you, I could, I could say the same thing. That's hope that only the resurrection. 
the Bible says, if Christ be not risen, then we have no hope of our own personal resurrection. And the resurrection didn't affirm anything else to me. It affirmed to me, it affirms to me the fact that I have hope in this life, no matter what happens, and I have hope in the life to come. I close with a story, and I really, really gave a lot of thought and prayer to using this story because I've used it before, but and I struggled as to where to put it in the course of the sermon. I finally felt impressed to place it at the end because it sort of puts all of this together. And some of you have heard the story, but you know what? Some of you, like me, you don't remember I told it. <laughs> the good thing is, I do remember I told it. <laughs> But whether you remember it or not, it doesn't matter. It's, one of the most, it's a true story. It's one reason I like it. And a powerful story. It's a story of a, let's say it's a true story. It all took place in Appalachia. And we all know that those parts of our country are some of the poorest of the poor. And there happened to be a school in Appalachia that uh, only young men attended. They could not keep a teacher. Two or three days, two or three weeks at the most. And these guys were rough and tough. Some of them were bigger than the teacher. The teacher just couldn't take it and, and he'd leave. There was a vacancy. And the young man had just finished college. He came to the school officials and he said, I'd like that job. He looked at him and said, young man, we, we don't think you know what you're asking for. We're going to be honest with you. You're asking for a terrible beating because no teacher has been able to survive there over a few weeks. Young man thought a few minutes and then he said, I'll accept that challenge. A few days later, he showed up at the school. And big, old, uh, big old Tom looked him over and Tom was perhaps the biggest kid in the school. And Tom whispered to one of his buddies, he said, uh, I won't have any problem with him. I'll lick him like you'd lick a little bird. He won't last long. Teacher stood in front of that group of young men and he said, fellas, I want us to have a good school. And I know that you do. And, but in order to do that, we're going to have to have a set of rules. And he said, I am. Uh, I'm not going to make up these rules. He said, I'm going to ask you to help me. And so they began to list the rules on the blackboard, no stealing and be on time. And they went on until they had listed 10 different rules that you had to abide by. Everybody had to abide by the rules. And then the teacher said, well, guys, rules are no good unless there is, a uh, there is punishment for breaking the rules. We have to enforce them. So what's the punishment? And somebody spoke up and said, the punishment for breaking any one of the ten rules is ten licks with a rod across the back with the coat off. The teacher said, fellas, that's, that's pretty tough. He said, are you willing to stand by that? And they all agreed, yes, yes we are. And things went pretty well for a few days. And things, the teacher thought, well, we're home free now. We're going to make it. And Till one day, Big Tom came in, upset. He said, teacher, somebody stole my lunch. Teacher began to ask around, and finally someone said, I, I saw little Timmy take Tommy's lunch. Teacher called little Timmy up to the front of the church, and to the church in front of the school. And little Timmy admitted, I, Teacher, I'm sorry, but I, I, took his, I took his lunch. Teacher said, Timmy, you know the punishment? Ten licks across the back with a, with a rod. That's the punishment, and you agreed as the others did to that uh, punishment. And Timmy said, uh, Teacher, I'll, I'll take those licks, 
But he said, please don't make me take my coat off. Teacher said, Timmy, I, I'm sorry. You helped make the rules, and that's the rule. Ten licks across your back with your coat off. Little Timmy began to unbutton his big coat. and What, his, what the teacher observed, he couldn't believe. He said to himself, I've never seen a bony body. I've never seen a body as bony as this little fellas. You could see his ribs actually almost punching through the skin. He thought to himself, how in the world can I do this? He said, if I, if I lick this little fella with this rod ten times, he's dead. Can't handle it. There's no shirt on. Just the bare skin and bones. The teacher said, Timmy, why would you come to school today without a, without a shirt on? He said, uh, teacher, my daddy died. It's just me and mom and my brother. And we're poor. He said, I only have two shirts. I only have one shirt. And said, I had to leave that shirt at home today for mom to, to wash it for me. And I wore my big brother's coat to keep me warm. The teacher thought, how in the world? His ribs are almost sticking out. If I lay one or two rods on this kid, I, I'll, I'll destroy his life. But he said, if I, if I don't go through with it, I'll never be able to keep this school together. And so he said, little Timmy, he said, lean down. And little Timmy leaned down. That teacher drew back that rod to flick that punishment on that little body. And as he did, he felt a big arm, pan take place of his arm. And uh, he looked and there was Big Tom. Big Tom's holding that hand back. He couldn't, he couldn't inflict that punishment. Big, Big Tom said, teacher, he said, I know that, uh, I know there, there are rules. And I know there's punishment. He said, teacher, there's nothing that says I can't take his place. Big Tom took his coat off. Big brawny body. Teacher drew back one time and two times and three times and four times and on the fifth time. Rod broke. He could hear the sobs of the he could hear the sobs of the other students in the room. And when he looked, little Timmy had come over. Little Timmy had put his arms around big old Tom's neck, away from the teacher. And he was weeping. Big Tom was weeping. Little Timmy said, Tom, I'm sorry. Forgive me for taking your lunch. But I want you to know something, big Tom. I love you till the day I die for taking my licking for me. That's a human story. That's a true story. But let me tell you a true story. The Son of God, the sinfully Son of God, the perfect son of God. He came out of glory. And for a sinner like me, he said, I'll take his whipping for him. And I'll shed my blood for him. And you know what my response ought to be? You know what your response ought to be? Jesus, forgive me. And I love you. 
and I'll serve you till the day I die. That ought to be my response. That ought to be your response today. That's what Easter's all about. It's about a Savior, the Lord Jesus. Came from heaven. Died a cruel death. Read it. A cruel death. As cruel as man, a man ever faced. He suffered as no man ever suffered. And you know what? He didn't do that. He did that for his enemies. Because you know what? You and I are enemies to God until we make peace by the blood of his son, Jesus. Friend, I'll tell you something. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I have what nobody else could give me but Jesus. I'm glad no matter what happens tomorrow, he said, I'll never ever, ever leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be there with you and for you. And you know what he said? He said, and at the end of the way, when everything's said and done, and you lay down and die, he said, I'm going to send my angels out of glory. And they're going to pick you up. And they're going to bring you to me. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. There ain't a better deal in all the world. There ain't a better deal in all the world than that deal. Nobody can give you what Jesus can give you. And if you don't have it this morning, quit putting it off. We did the Lord's Supper this past Wednesday night. You know, uh, you know what Jesus said? He said, every time you take that supper that represents my body and my blood, he said, you do it in remembrance of me until... I come back. And he's coming back. And it's going to be soon. And if you aren't ready, you know what? It's going to be too late. You'll spend eternity in a place that you don't want to spend eternity in hell. Those who are saved are going to spend eternity in heaven. Amen? Amen. Bow with me, Father. If I stood on this pulpit platform all day, and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving me, dying for me, being raised from the grave. I couldn't say that enough. A little lady said to me the other day, Father, you, you heard that conversation. She said, somebody told me that I live in the house that you once lived in. And I said, where do you live? And she told me on Hagen Street in Rock Hill. I said, is it the house that sits sort of cat cat cornered? And she said, yes, it is. I said, how long do you live there? She said, I've lived there 40 years. My mom bought the house and she's passed. And I keep living there. I said, I go by there quite often. Because I want to remember where I was as a little boy on a poor mill village with an alcoholic father, an abusive father. I want to remember where I was. And I want to remember where God brought me to, I said to her. And Father, I stand here this morning and say to this congregation, I am what I am today, as Paul said, by the grace of God. Without you, shed blood without your grace without your love I'd still be back where I once was and I want to say to you this morning Father I praise you and I bless you and I sing hallelujahs to you this morning and Father I know that what happened in my life can happen in the life of any person in this building this morning if they're willing just simply to acknowledge the fact through the Holy Spirit I'm a sinner I'm lost I'm doomed and damned to an eternity in hell. But if I'll receive what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross, if I'll accept the fact of the resurrection, and I will believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. And Father God, I pray right now, right now, because there are lost people here. 
There are people whom you love and you said you're not willing that any should perish but all come to repentance. There's some here right now that if they died today, they spend eternity in hell. That's not your will. That's not what any of us who are Christians want to happen. It's the Holy Spirit of God. Precious, powerful Holy Spirit. Convince them of their need of Jesus and convict them this morning. And I pray that come in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. Greg leads us in our hymn of invitation. In any way the Holy Spirit spoken to you this morning. I stand here to receive you if you'd like to come and kneel at this altar and pray. I invite you to come do that this morning. is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all, blessed Bow your heads with me, would you please, for just a moment. I don't normally just extend an invitation. Denise, play just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Only one way to come to Jesus, just like you are. The devil's telling some of you, you're too bad. You've waited too long. The fact that you're here this morning, friend, tells me that God brought you here. And God has something special for you this morning. All you need to do is walk this aisle. Take this pastor's hand. Receive Christ into your life. He'll save you from any life that you've lived. Not ask any questions. He'll not chastise you. He'll just say, son, I'm glad you've come. Daughter, I'm glad you've come this morning. Two stanzas are short stanzas. I could not let you go if I did not give you that extended invitation to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. Anybody? You don't even have to attend this church regularly. We're not talking about church membership. We're talking about salvation this morning. We're talking about you coming down this morning, taking this pastor's hand and saying, Pastor, I will receive Christ in my life. Don't put it off, folks. Don't put it off. Ran into a classmate the other day down at therapy. We got to talking. He said, Ray, we're losing too many. He met members in our graduating class. You know what? That's true. And in your class, graduating class in high school, if you think a minute, quite a few have passed on out into eternity. Were they ready to meet God or not? Amos said, prepare to meet thy God. People prepare for everything under the sun. They re- prepare for retirement. They prepare for kids' college. They prepare for everything imaginable. And yet, so many miss preparing for the most important thing in the world, your relationship to God through Jesus Christ. Another stanza. I beg you, come. Won't embarrass you. Simply let you sit down here, and after the service, me or someone who's trained will 
step into one of these rooms. We'll not make a spectacle of you. We'll just, with the Holy Spirit's help, show you the way to Jesus. That's all we'll do. And you'll never regret it. I never will regret that day as a nine-year-old boy. I sat on that little bank by a die branch. And somebody took the wordless Bible and showed me the way to Jesus. I've never, ever, ever regretted giving my life to Christ. And you won't either. I've regretted some of the things I've done, ways I've treated him. But I've never regretted inviting him into my life. Last answer. glad you've come especially you who are visiting this morning if you don't have a regular church home I and this entire church family extend a very warm invitation to you to come join us anytime Sunday school at 10 on Sundays worship at 11 Wednesday night supper at 6 o'clock enjoy a good meal and good fellowship and then our Bible study and prayer and times for the children and young people if I can help you ever anyway anytime Please let me help you. I'm going to ask Greg to take the hymnal. I think an appropriate way to end is sing that song, Victory in Jesus. Sing the first stanza of that as our closing prayer, closing song this morning.